please take a moment to hit those like and subscribe buttons. While a small gesture, it really means a lot to Wild 7 Studios and allows us to continue creating meaningful and fun content for your listening and viewing pleasure. This is part two of The Luck of Roaring Camp. The next day, Cherokee Sal had such rude sepulture as Roaring Camp afforded. After her body had been committed to the hillside, there was a formal meeting of the camp to discuss what should be done with her infant. A resolution to adopt it was unanimous and enthusiastic, but an animated discussion in regard to the manner and feasibility of providing for its wants at once sprang up. It was remarkable that the argument partook of none of those fierce personalities with which discussions were usually conducted at Roaring Camp. Tipton proposed that they should send the child to Red Dog, a distance of 40 miles, where female attention could be procured. But the unlucky suggestion met with fierce and unanimous opposition. It was evident that no plan which entailed parting from their new acquisition would for a moment be entertained. Besides, said Tom Ryder, them fellows at Red Dog would swap it and ring in somebody else on us. A disbelief in the honesty of other camps prevailed at Roaring Camp, as in other places. The introduction of a female nurse in the camp also met with objection. It was argued that no decent woman could be prevailed to accept Roaring Camp as her home, and the speaker urged that they didn't want any more of the other kind. This unkind allusion to the defunct mother, harsh as it may seem, was the first spasm of propriety, the first symptom of the camp's regeneration. Stumpy advanced nothing, Perhaps he felt a certain delicacy in interfering with the selection of a possible successor in his office. But when questioned, he averred stoutly that he and Ginny, the mammal before alluded to, could manage to rear the child. There was something original, independent, and heroic about the plan that pleased the camp. Stumpy was retained. Certain articles were sent for to Sacramento. Mind, said the treasurer, as he pressed a bag of gold dust into the expressman's hand, the best that can be got, lace, you know, and filigree work and frills, damn the cost. Strange to say, the child thrived. Perhaps the invigorating climate of the mountain camp was compensation for material deficiencies. Nature took the foundling to her broader breast. In that rare atmosphere of the Sierra foothills, that air pungent with balsamic odor, that ethereal cordial at once bracing and exhilarating, he may have found food and nourishment or a subtle chemistry that transmuted ass's milk to lime and phosphorus. Stumpy inclined to the belief that it was the latter, and good nursing. Me and that ass, he would say, has been father and mother to him. Don't you, he would add, apostrophizing the helpless bundle before him, never go back on us. By the time he was a month old, the necessity of giving him a name became apparent. He'd generally been known as the Kid, Stumpy's Boy, the Coyote, an allusion to his vocal powers, and even by Kentuck's endearing diminutive of the damned little cuss. But these were felt to be vague and unsatisfactory, and were at last dismissed under another influence. Gamblers and adventurers are generally superstitious, and Oakhurst one day declared that the baby had brought the luck to Roaring Camp. It was certain that of late they had been successful. Luck 
was the name agreed upon, with the prefix of Tommy for greater convenience. No allusion was made to the mother, and the father was unknown. It's better, said the philosophical Oakhurst, to take a fresh deal all round. Call him luck and start him fair. A day was accordingly set apart for the christening. What was meant by this ceremony, the reader may imagine, who has already gathered some idea of the reckless irreverence of Roaring Camp. The master of ceremonies was one Boston, a noted wag, and the occasion seemed to promise the greatest facetiousness. <laughs> this ingenious satirist had spent two days in preparing a burlesque of the church service with pointed local allusions. The choir was properly trained, and Sandy Tipton was to stand godfather. But after the procession had marched to the grove with music and banners, and the child had been deposited before a mock altar, Stumpy stepped before the expectant crowd. It ain't my style to spoil fun, boys, said the little man, stoutly eyeing the faces around him. But it strikes me that this thing ain't exactly on the square. It's playing it pretty low down on this year, baby, to ring in fun on him that he ain't going to understand. And if there's going to be any godfathers round, I'd like to see who's got any better rights than me. A silence followed Stumpy's speech. To the credit of all humorists, be it said that the first man to acknowledge its justice was the satirist thus stopped of his fun. But said Stumpy, quickly following up his advantage. We're here for a christening, and we'll have it. I proclaim you, Thomas Luck, according to the laws of the United States and the state of California, so help me God. <laughs> it was the first time that the name of the deity had been otherwise uttered than profanely in the camp. The form of christening was perhaps even more ludicrous than the satirist had conceived. But strangely enough, nobody saw it and nobody laughed. Tommy was christened as seriously as he would have been under a Christian roof and cried and was comforted in as orthodox fashion. And so the work of regeneration began in Roaring Camp. Almost imperceptibly, a change came over the settlement. The cabin assigned to Tommy Luck, or the Luck, as he was more frequently called, first showed signs of improvement. It was kept scrupulously clean and whitewashed. Then it was boarded, clothed, and papered. The rosewood cradle, packed 80 miles by mule, had, in Stumpy's way of putting it, Sort of killed the rest of the furniture. So the rehabilitation of the cabin became a necessity. The men who were in the habit of lounging in at Stumpy's to see how the luck got on seemed to appreciate the change. And in self-defense, the rival establishment of Tuttle's Grocery bestirred itself and imported a carpet and mirrors. The reflections of the latter on the appearance of Roaring Camp tended to produce stricter habits of personal cleanliness. Again, Stumpy imposed a kind of quarantine upon those who aspired to the honor and privilege of holding the luck. It was a cruel mortification to Kentuck, who, in the carelessness of a large nature and the habits of frontier life, had begun to regard all garments as a second cuticle, which, like a snake's, only sloughed off through decay, to be debarred this privilege from certain prudential reasons. Yet such was the subtle influence of innovation that he thereafter appeared regularly every afternoon in a clean shirt and face still shining from his ablutions. Nor were moral and social sanitary laws neglected. Tommy, who was supposed to spend his whole existence in a persistent attempt to repose, must not be disturbed by noise. The shouting and yelling which had gained the camp its 
infelicitous tattle were not permitted within hearing distance of Stumpy's. The men conversed in whispers or smoked with Indian gravity. Profanity was tacitly given up in these sacred precincts. And throughout the camp, a popular form of expletive known as damn the luck and curse the luck was abandoned as having a new personal bearing. On board of the Arathusa, vocal music was not interdicted, being supposed to have a soothing, tranquilizing quality. And one song, sung by Manowar Jack, an English sailor from Her Majesty's Australian colonies, was quite popular as a lullaby. It was a lugubrious recital of the exploits of the Arethusa 74 in a muffled manner, ending with a prolonged dying fall at the burden of each verse on board of the Arethusa. It was a fine sight seeing Jack holding the luck, rocking from side to side as if with the motion of a ship and crooning forth this naval ditty. Either through the peculiar rocking of Jack, or the length of his song, it contained 90 stanzas and was continued with conscientious deliberation to the bitter end, the lullaby generally had the desired effect. At such times, the men would lie at full length under the trees in the soft summer twilight, smoking their pipes and drinking in the melodious utterances. An indistinct idea that this was pastoral happiness pervaded the camp. This here kind of thing, said the Cockney Simmons, meditatively reclining on his elbow, is heavenly. It reminded him of Greenwich. On the long summer days, the luck was usually carried to the gulch from whence the golden store of Roaring Camp was taken. There, on a blanket spread over pine boughs, he would lie while the men were working in the ditches below. Latterly, there was a rude attempt to decorate this bower with flowers and sweet-smelling shrubs, and generally, someone would bring him a cluster of wild honeysuckles, azaleas, or the painted blossoms of lost mariposas. The men had suddenly awakened to the fact that there were beauty and significance in these trifles, which they had so long trodden carelessly beneath their feet. A flake of glittering mica, a fragment of variegated quartz, a bright pebble from the bed of the creek, became beautiful to eyes thus cleared and strengthened, and were invariably put aside for the luck. It was wonderful how many treasures the woods and hillsides yielded that would do for Tommy. Surrounded by playthings such as never child out of fairyland had before, it is to be hoped that Tommy was content. He appeared to be serenely happy, albeit there was an infantile gravity about him, a contemplative light in his round gray eyes that sometimes worried Stumpy. He was always tractable and quiet, and it is recorded that once... Having crept beyond his corral, a hedge of tessellated pine boughs, which surrounded his bed, he dropped over the bank on his head in the soft earth and remained with his mottled legs in the air in that position for at least five minutes with unflinching gravity. He was extricated without a murmur. I hesitate to record the many other instances of his sagacity, which rest, unfortunately, upon the statements of prejudiced friends. Some of them were not without a tinge of superstition. I crept up the bank just now, said Kentuck one day, in a breathless state of excitement, and dern my skin if he was a-talking to a jaybird as he was a-sitting on his lap. There they was just as free and sociable as anything you please, a-jawing at each other just like two cherry bums. Howbeit, 
whether creeping over the pine boughs or lying lazily on his back, blinking at the leaves above him, to him the birds sang, the squirrels chattered, and the flowers bloomed. Nature was his nurse and playfellow. For him she would let slip between the leaves golden shafts of sunlight that fell just within his grasp. She would send wandering breezes to visit him with the balm of bay and resinous gum. To him the tall redwoods nodded familiarly and sleepily. The bumblebees buzzed, and the rooks cawed a slumbrous accompaniment. Such was the golden summer of Roaring Camp. They were flush times, and the luck was with them. The claims had yielded enormously. The camp was jealous of its privileges and looked suspiciously on strangers. No encouragement was given to immigration, and to make their seclusion more perfect, the land on either side of the mountain wall that surrounded the camp they duly preempted. This, and a reputation for singular proficiency with the revolver, kept the reserve of Roaring Camp inviolate. The expressmen, their only connecting link with the surrounding world, sometimes told wonderful stories of the camp. He would say, They've a street up there in Roaring that would lay over any street in Red Dog. They've got vines and flowers around their houses, and they wash themselves twice a day. But they're mighty rough on strangers and they worship an engine baby. With the prosperity of the camp came a desire for further improvement. It was supposed to build a hotel in the following spring, and to invite one or two decent families to reside there for the sake of the luck, who might perhaps profit by female companionship. The sacrifice that this concession to the sex cost these men who were fiercely skeptical in regard to its general virtue and usefulness, can only be accounted for by their affection for Tommy. The few still held out, but the resolve could not be carried into effect for three months, and the minority meekly yielded in the hope that something might turn up to prevent it. And it did. Winter of 1851 will long be remembered in the foothills. The snow lay deep on the Sierras, and every mountain creek became a river, and every river a lake. Each gorge and gulch was transformed into a tumultuous water course that descended the hillsides tearing down giant trees and scattering its drift and debris along the plain. Red Dog had been twice underwater, and Roaring Camp had been forewarned. Water put the gold into them gulches, said Stumpy. It been here once and will be here again. And that night, the North Fork suddenly leapt over its banks and swept up the triangular valley of Roaring Camp. In the confusion of rushing water, crashing trees, and crackling timber, and the darkness which seemed to flow with the water and blot out the fair valley, but little could be done to collect the scattered camp. When the morning broke, the cabin of Stumpy, nearest the river bank, was gone. Higher up the gulch they found the body of its unlucky owner, but the pride 
the hope, the joy, the luck of Roaring Camp had disappeared. They were returning with sad hearts when a shout from the bank recalled them. It was a relief boat from down the river. They had picked up, they said, a man and an infant, nearly exhausted, about two miles below. Did anybody know them, and did they belong here? It needed but a glance to show them Kentuck, lying there, cruelly crushed and bruised, but still holding the luck of roaring camp in his arms. As they bent over the strangely assorted pair, they saw that the child was cold and pulseless. He is dead, said one. Kentuck opened his eyes. Dead? He repeated feebly. Yes, my man, and you are dying too. A smile lit the eyes of the expiring Kentuck. Dying, he repeated. He's a taken me with him. Tell the boys, I've got the luck with me now. And the strong man, clinging to the frail babe as a drowning man is said to cling to a straw, drifted away into the shadowy river that flows forever to the unknown sea. You have been listening to Storyscapes on the Wild 7 Podcast Network. The story you have just heard is The Luck of Roaring Camp by Bret Hart. Performed and sound designed by Alex Rogers. Opening theme music by Inca Rose. Produced by Chris Trull. Keep listening for more Storyscapes.